Good afternoon and welcome to this week's edition of the Middle East and Africa Sustainability Dialogues podcast, a series in which we tackle some of the variety of issues that help us build a pathway, a roadmap to net zero across the Middle East and Africa region. Many countries have identified different target dates, 2050, 2060, for when they hope their economies can become net zero. But of course, all of us working in companies, all of us as individuals, have our own sense of where that target date is and how to get there. And ultimately, we have to start to surface some of those solutions. And that's essentially what this podcast series is about, helping put together some meat on the bone of how to actually get to the destination that we all seek. I'd like to welcome our guests on this week's podcast, where we're going to tackle the question, how to effectively communicate the issues around climate change and the circular economy. Seems like a fairly simple idea, but inevitably, as we all know from so many other walks of life, communications are very, very complicated to get messages to land so that they can trigger impact. Let's kick off with giving our guests each a sort of opening comments and start with Noor Balfaki, Corporate Affairs and Communications Senior Manager at Unilever GCC. Noor, your thoughts on the question we're tackling today. Thank you so much, uh, Sean, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today in this uh, podcast. Uh, communication is key and crucial, uh, especially around the topic of sustainability and circular economy. Um, it's a new topic that we started hearing people talking about it here and there. And the importance of having a communication strategy in place, um, uh, defining the key stakeholder that, that should be engaged in this communication is very crucial. And um, I look forward to uh, to add more details about that uh, with, with uh, my colleagues here in the session. Well, thank you. Let's welcome Alexander Euler, Managing Director of Hydroloop Middle East, has just come in from his virtual pool and his virtual swimming togs <laughs> and is going to help us uh, answer this question of how to effectively communicate the issues around climate change and the circular economy. Alexander. Uh, Sean, thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone. Um, happy to be here. Uh, as you can see, I just came out of the pool. Um, the hair is dry by sheer miracle. Um, by willpower. See, willpower, <laughs> willpower can dry your hair. Willpower <laughs> can get us uh, over well, overcoming this uh, climate challenge. Well, that's uh, that's uh, it's good that you say that because I, I do believe it's a matter of, of willpower. Uh, in terms of communication, I think as 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 Noor uh, just uh, said, it, it's key. Obviously, um, I'd like to just stress that. Um, well, I'm an optimist by nature, so I would recommend or I would like to say that positive communication is more important than just communication. So basically stay away from fear mongering. I think we've we've had enough of that, um, of speaking so much about catastrophes, but um, concentrate more on what goes beyond that. Once we fix all this, what will it look like? How wonderful it will be? And also, uh, I think it is a pers very personal um, message. Of course, we're all representing companies here and big organizations, uh, but at the end, it is a very personal uh, issue. So I think about myself, obviously I think about my children, my grandchildren, and uh, so I really do believe in the power of uh, speaking to human beings and not to organizations. Let's welcome Abdul Latif al Bitawi, Secretary General and Honorary Vice Chair of the Energy Institute Middle East Branch. Of course, the Energy Institute, one of the world's most respected uh, energy organizations representing uh, many hundreds of, of members, companies uh, across the full value chain uh, of the energy sector. Abdul Latif, your thoughts on the question. Ultimately, the Energy Institute is one of the biggest communicators in the sector. Thank you, Sean, and, and a pleasure to be with you all uh, today. Um, firstly, when I read the question, I was really excited and I thought this is a very important question. Uh, and I think we face challenges really in, in the communication, especially when we speak and meet with different people from different sectors and at different levels, if you say, of responsibilities, but also of professionalism. Um, communication is very important, not just to tackle this this subject, but it's it's important for everything in our life, really. 
And I think the, the important uh, uh, point here is that how we communicate, uh, you know, differs from uh, person to person. Um, but but I'm, I'm excited really to discuss further this this today with, with my colleagues. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Noor, you're obviously engaged to work and represent a very large company, global company in a, in a region, uh, GCC region. Uh, and we're emerging into an era of greater transparency uh, uh, where uh, the content and data uh, even uh, is, is starting to become increasingly recognized as important uh, we were working recently with the statistics center Abu Dhabi, which was itself a, a statistics center in which they're starting to try and surface uh, useful and critical data for uh, general consumption. But my point uh, coming to you is that the cultural history in, re in recent times is not uh, one in which we're deep in a communications sort of affluent region. And I'm wondering from your perspective, as we move forward and the critical piece of communications What's the leap we need to specifically make in this region in order for it to sort of leapfrog what might be a sort of a generation of transparency? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sean. Actually, uh, let's start from the beginning. In a, any organization or entity or a country would like just to make a leapfrog when it comes to circular economy or climate change. It's very important to put in place a very comprehensive uh, uh, communication strategy and uh, that take into consideration all different stakeholders, including the internal stakeholders, the employees, the suppliers, the customers, and the external for sure is the policy makers and the partners and, and even the, 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 the public and the community. So anything related to this, it has to be part of this uh, communication strategy. And hence, there is an increasing trend towards circular economy at a global scale. So the reason um, uh, the, the reason why communication is fundamental for, sust for sustainability and circular economy can be explained by considering the nature of what we're talking about, uh, which branch of circular economy or sustainability. What about um, when you're looking at a company in your case, obviously you're bringing to the ground here in the Gulf region, it's on uh, your territory of responsibility, obviously Unilever is across all of the Middle East and North Africa, but you are a global company bringing a global communications message and strategy, but adapting it for the ground here. How does that parallel with the similar challenge of the circular economy or the climate challenge, a global narrative that has to be anchored to the ground here? What are your sort of experiences from bringing the, the, the uh, Unilever message to the ground and how much of a change does it have to make as it comes into this region from what it globally to regional? Yeah, it's 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 not an easy process, by the way. It's um, it's usually when we talk about sustainability, we say it is um, um, freedom within a framework. And Unilever is known for its global ambitions when it comes to sustainability and circular economy. Cascading this down to the countries and the regions, and part of it is GCC. It took it took us a process uh, uh, since 2010. And when we started talking sustainability and circular economy, we were like talking different language uh, to policymakers, to our consumers, to our customers. And we were saying we were um, landing some activation through our brands with customers. Uh, we we tried our best to pick the relevant causes that the local consumer would relate to. Like right. for example, I'll give you an example. Uh, Life boy. Lifeboy as a brand, yeah. the purpose of Lifeboy is just to uh, to raise awareness about the importance of hand hygiene. It worked very well in countries like China and India. When we brought it here to 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 our region, we made sure when we uh, design it, we design it in a way that serve a need in the community. And for that, we took the opportunity to make sure that we are landing the message during the pandemics. And not only during COVID 2020, and even before that, during SARS, to during the, the break of many other viruses, Lifebuoy 
chose to, to pick the message that is relevant to the audience. This is on one side. The other side is the regulators and the policy makers. One of the things that we established is to build a very strong relationship with the authorities and to be to lead a lot of trade associations and uh, industry groups together uh, where we come closely and talk to different authorities like the Ministry of Environment, like in Saudi now we started a new uh, industry group under the Federation of Saudi Chambers. The aim is to help the authorities design the waste management uh, regulation in a way that there is an EPR, which is the extended producer responsibility. And this is one of the key initiatives that Unilever is leading globally. And now we are leading internally with key stakeholders. Alexander, I, I'm curious to get your thoughts on, on the spectacular in the context of communications. And inevitably, you're the managing director of Hydroloop Middle East. Uh, we are in a region where the biggest and the fastest and, 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 and now in the sustainability era in terms of NEOM in Saudi Arabia and other spectacular projects uh, give visionary sense of what's possible and at the same token can kind of you know, distract, if you like, the uh, obfuscate the, the intention. So I'm just wanted to get your thoughts. Inevitably, uh, you are uh, the, the hydro loop from some perspective could be in the spectacular. Is it useful to have those spectacular as communications tools or is it, does it take people's minds away from the very practical, like Noor was talking about in terms of the application of washing your hands and the simplicity of, of things? I'm just wondering your views on that and, and your experience of that, because obviously you would be in support of it given you are uh, with Hydroloop. Yeah, uh, well, I, I, th I think it's a matter of a balance because sometimes you do need the, the spectacular so that the word is spread uh, on, on, on these solutions. In our case, of course, we're talking about uh, water, uh, um, recycling water, um, uh, saving water, which is uh, very key, right? And uh, we've had the experience where we've been tempted into going into the spectacular, which again, I think it's, it's, it's uh, kind, of, kind of important, but uh, where the rubber hits the road is actual, it's behind the scenes. It's in every single home, in every uh, in every single building that, for example, wastes water or or is not managing their water properly. So, um, my experience is that, fortunately or unfortunately, I have to do both at the same time. So, give some space to the spectacular, but never forget that there's the down and dirty work that has to be done person by person, home by home, building by building, uh, so that, you know, uh, together it makes a real impact. Um, so, yeah, so that's, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of weird. Sometimes you have to switch hats. And so, for example, these big uh, mega projects uh, you speak with and they say, can you, can you build a huge one? And we're like, we could, it would look great. And it would be uh, it would be great for spreading a message. However, is this the right, the correct approach to making a real impact? And and there we, it, it takes a matter of let's say internal communication to then um, perhaps get to the conclusion that it's actually better to go like like little ants uh, is the way I like to, to describe it. You Small know? steps, Abdulatif. You're you're with the Energy Institute. Obviously, you have many members who have. Have uh, you know who are under a variety of uh, review of 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 of, of you know spectacular approval, but also in increasingly around the communication piece, there is this new phrase of greenwashing, saying things, talking up things in order to, for brand elevation, but the actually substance. Uh, is is uncertain. I'm just wondering from from the Energy Institute's perspective, where those two universes need to align, and what communications are, are you conveying to your members about the sensitivities in that space now? Um, I think it's it's important that the message is clear to all, right? 
and then the terms the words that we use in each message is again is at the level of of the targeted if you say audience and if if the message get across the same message get across different people then there is you know the the potential of either misunderstanding or even sometimes being misled you know towards you know certain things and when you talk about greenwashing now so, some will go for that unintentionally but because they lack the, the knowledge, they like the proper, if you say, information. Some they may do it intentionally because they find a way around, you know, what is being required. And and I think, I believe is, is you know, it's important that we go back to the basics and make it very clear and direct to, to different people, you know, from different backgrounds with different, you know, uh, let's say working in different sectors. Uh, you, you use a word, you know, for example, you, you know, said greenwashing and then do we all really understand what is a greenwashing? Are we all on the same definition? Or do you are you referring to something which I may, you know, refer to something different? And then for me, greenwashing is good. For you, it's bad. Uh, but also, you know, other terms, you know, you talk about, you know, sustainability, circularity, climate change, etc. Are we all having the same definition? Are we all referring to the same, you know, uh, information? Or are we talking about different things, although using the same word? And, and I think this is the challenge, and this is the difficulty, uh, and this is where we we may face, you know, uh, if you say um, uh, drawbacks or you know obstacles on on our way or pathway, you know, to net zero and then to you know a sustainable uh, future for for our generation. Noor, of course, Unilever is a very large consumer product uh, business where uh, reuse and recycle historically hasn't been an integral part of the design structure of the product making, if you like. I'm wondering uh, how that's changing, how important is that in, in the context of it changing within your industry and how that is being communicated to your customers? Yeah, um, this is actually a very important question and um, uh, waste, for example, let me just pick one example um, under this, uh, which is the plastic and the waste management. So Unilever uh, is committed to keeping its plastic packaging in the loop and out of the environment. And in 2017, we are we announced that we are committed to ensure that 100% of the plastic we are using in packaging uh, will be designed to be either reusable, recyclable, or combustible by 2025. So in 2019, we became the first major consumer goods company to commit to an absolute plastic um, reduction across all our portfolio by having the use of virgin plastic and accelerating the use of the post-consumer recycled plastic, which is a PCR. Now, this is a very uh, ambitious goal that we are, um, are committed to. Now, cascading this again to the region, it requires a lot of things, and especially in a region like our GCC, where the infrastructure is not ready for that, this required a lot of communication with first suppliers, like to look into where we can make a big impact towards achieving this, uh, this uh, goal. One of the um, key stakeholders that we are currently um, in co communication with is in K KSA, for example, the Ministry of Industry. We are in close communication with them just to make sure how we can source these uh, recycled plastic, how we can reduce our environmental and f uh, carbon footprint by sourcing clean uh, energy or or some some clean uh, carbon um, uh, sources uses in chemicals in, in one of the products that we are manufacturing. So this type of communication now, it's not for us. It's at a very high level with some policy makers for us to make sure that we are to, uh, heading towards achieving our goal. So um, this is one example. Another example is what we do with the industry in terms of advocacy and lobbying making sure that when we talk as a private sector to authorities, we have a common message. And it's not only Unilever is trying to achieve uh, less uh, uh, carbon footprint or um, uh, less plastic or whatever, we know that other players in the market are having the same, same goal. So sharing these goals and working together as industry helped a lot in 
making progress. I wanted uh, Alex just to come back to that local cultural piece in terms of the communication, because of course, in your area of water reuse, which is uh, a very, very critical part of the uh, circular economy, inevitably, and 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 globally, of course, even where water is ample in ample supply, right. but uh, but ultimately, especially where it isn't, uh, and, and in a region like the Middle East and the Gulf, where we live in in a water stressed environment, uh, but culturally, there's a strong resistance to water reuse. Uh, I'm wondering how does that communication overcome what is is a cultural as well as a a, a sort of a, a consumer challenge? And well, it definitely is a challenge in this region specifically. Like you said, the water scarcity uh, um, issue is global at this point, uh, but of course it's more pronounced here in our region. Uh, our region is uh, is has some um, uh, peculiarities. So we have the highest per capita consumption of water in the world. We have the most expensive water to produce in the world, and we have some of the lowest water tariffs in the world to the end consumer. That means that it's highly subsidized by, by the governments. So the incentive is to, uh, unfortunately right now, is to not give value to water. And that is a big, big part of, of let's say, a, a, a cultural a trait in, in our region. It's so, also a global challenge when you think of carbon because carbon doesn't have a price in most jurisdiction okay. either. And exactly. consequently, it's it's without value if it doesn't have a price. Exactly, or the, or the price is so low that people essentially think that it's free and that it's, it's endless, and that's not the case. So there, um, uh, it's, it's a matter of working on, obviously on communication with the, with the and user for the citizen, the, the individual, like I said before, but it's also, it requires a lot of work with the authorities so that they realize that at the end of the day, it's the authorities that are paying for this, uh, for the correct price of water. So the production of this, of this water. Um, it's, it's interesting because when you speak to, to many people in, in this region, uh, when you mention water, they say it's more valuable than gold. Yet you see them washing their car every day, basically with a hose. With a potable water. With potable water, and so so anyway, so we of course um, we 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 uh, we leverage technology to bring a solution. Um, but I think the key will be it will be a to put together the proper incentives from a legislative and regulatory standpoint to incentivize water conservation and not water waste through an artificially uh, low tariff. Uh, some countries have done that. There are some countries in our region that are already on their way and are starting to do that. Uh, Kuwait is a, is a good example. Um, but uh, of course, there's a long way to go. Things go, go a bit a bit slower in, in terms of, of changing minds. Right? And perhaps as we get into uh, uh, as part of the, the future uh, and, and present here in the UAE as well, where it come, where we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, indigenous farming starting to emerge through um, uh, new technologies and uh, right. organics. And, and as one identifies the proximity of of food production with water, uh, where uh, in the past the, the two have been so far removed with food That's production right. in other parts of the world. I want to just wrap up our final sort of round robin together uh, by talking a bit about COP27, which is upon us, and particularly with the question of how much of climate change in, in action is a communication issue and where and how COP27 can help with that, given uh, that it makes, as we were talking earlier, it's the spectacular. It's arrived in the region, COP27 and COP28. So a huge vehicle to elevate communication around the climate challenge and the circular economy. Let's start with you, Abdul Latif, as the sort of final comments, looking at that, well, the hope and expectation of COP27 to help elevate uh, uh, this communication challenge. Um. I believe that you know having COP27 in the region and next year COP28 and, and also in the region, uh, this by itself is is a very good communication, uh, if you say, tool. 
uh, increasing the awareness, spreading the message uh, locally, regionally, and globally. And, and what, I, I would like to specifically put sure. you on the spot. How are your members utilizing it? You obviously a lot of oil and gas members, a part of the Energy Institute, uh, as well as other energy cons energy producers. How are they seeing this opportunity? So, so companies in in general, not not necessarily only oil and gas, but companies in general. You know what, what I've seen is everyone is speaking about this, and especially that it's again happening in the region. Those who have interest in the region is like you know always asking you know okay what what are we going to do what will happen in cop 27 so what's next you know what's after that uh, uh, everyone is really you know excited and and keen to find out you know what can they do and and you know what can they deliver uh, through the cop itself but also after the cop itself uh, and that's why i think awareness has has increased you know whether we like it or not but it has increased because of these two events happening in the region uh, which i think is 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 great I think what we need to do, uh, and every one of us um, in different, you know, uh, let's say organizations at different levels, is really to to build up on this and and just continue the, if you say, the journey, uh, and 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 you know, communicate more and more with all you know stakeholders, and you know, two ways, three ways, whatever is that, but communicate with everyone. And f for me, it's important to get clear messages. Really, it's not just about you know communication. We have to have a clear message. You know, we have to have a clear you know, uh, information and, and and sometimes you need easy information. You know, when you use words and terms that are difficult, you know, things may get lost in, in between. It's it's really about, for me, it's about simplicity and being clear. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the point. That's the point. Noor, your final thoughts. Again, COP27, what is it for Unilever in the region and the world? How do you hope that uh, or expect or want to see uh, COP27, 28 uh, play a role in the communication issue related around climate change and action? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sean. Actually, uh, Unilever has been and always been part of the COP20 and we have 20, uh, COP in general. And, and, and this one happening in Egypt, we have a delegation coming from our global team. But there is something uh, additional that we're doing as well in the region. We as few companies, uh, we are signing an alliance with the WWF just to capitalize more on our commitment towards climate change in preparation for the COP when it comes to the UAE. So, and we will be signing this alliance um, 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 MOU uh, during uh, the, the COP27 in, 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 in Sharm el Sheikh. So, we are committed. And again, this is to stress on the importance of putting hands together and joining efforts. So, it's not only one organization leading on this, but it's 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 many it's a it's a group of of companies and uh we're putting one consolidated message around the same around the climate change uh, topic alexander last word for you and i'd like you to speak to the where you started out uh which That's was right. po positive versus negative messaging That's right. the media can quite often look for division and cop 27 is a and cops are always a place where the media light uh, can find a, a crack they're against them. They're not. They're not. Be, right. they're, there's division. I'm just wondering your perspective on the outlook for COP27 and the media messaging and public opinion, and how important that that it's somehow in a holistic place. Uh, you're right. I um, well, I, I, I wanted to go back to my the, the opening point again. Is is I am an optimist by nature. So. Um, I think in the case of COP27, I think it's a, obviously a great initiative, but um, like you said, media and large vested interests can hijack this kind of discussion and become just a political mumbo jumbo, if, if I can use that word, of nonsense, or, you know, technical words that contradict each other, that confuse, etc. So what I like to see, honestly, is uh, communication coming out that is personal and positive. And, you know, after we go through all this messy, um, let's say, um, way of communicating, we get to the point where somebody somehow um, explains to a, an individual, uh, a father, a mother, a, a, a son, a daughter, what the future will look like after we get done fixing this, how wonderful it will be how clean everything will be, how, what great food we'll have, you know, very simple direct messages to individuals. 
that is what I hope will be eventually the outcome after all this high level uh, messy conversation. Well, it's certainly a positive and optimistic place to close out our session together. Uh, and I'd like to thank you so much for joining us at the Middle East and Africa Sustainability Dialogues podcast series, which is our and our partner, strategic partner, of course, Microsoft, who are doing so much work in the in the Middle East and North Af and Africa as a whole in advancing the dialogue around sustainability and the solutions that hopefully uh, can be provided to deliver that. Alexander Euler, Managing Director of Hydroloop Middle East, thank you so much for participating with us today. I would also like to thank Abdul Latif al Batawi, Secretary General and Honorary Vice Chair of the Energy Institute Middle East Branch, and of course, Noor Balfaki, Corporate Affairs thank and Communications you. Senior Manager at Unilever GCC. It's great to have all your voices at the table, and we look forward to future conversations together. All the best. Thank, thank you thank so you much. So thank much. you for having thank me. You.